What is soft output decoding? Well, let's look at a standard communication system where the data comes in, and first of all, you do channel coding so that you can overcome any errors that might happen in the channel. Of course, at the receiver, you need to do decoding. To change the coded bits into something that can go over the channel, of course, we do modulation and demodulation. So let's think about that in a standard way. So let's look at a basic block parity check code to start with. So here we are sending five bits and we've done channel coding of parity so that we've added an extra bit so that we can overcome errors in the channel. So in this case, we had three ones in our five bits of data. So we need to add a one on the end so that there's an even number of ones and that's parity coding. And for more details about coding and also about modulation and demodulation and so on, look in the description below this video and you'll find lots of videos on the channel. Of course, if we've decoded correctly, we would get the same data sequence coming out. Let's think about this modulation and demodulation. Let's think about basic binary phase shift gain. So after modulation, we are transferring these ones and zeros into sinusoidal waveforms that have either a positive phase or a negative phase, and that's BPSK. So here we are mapping a zero to here, for example, and a one to here. And this is the waveforms that we're gonna send. And again, for details about constellation diagrams, look in the description below, you'll find videos. And of course, after the channel, when there's noise, when we do the demodulation and sample, we won't be getting exactly plus A and minus A. We'll be getting something that is a noisy version. So we might get something a bit less for the first one, because it's a, uh, sorry, for the first one here, a bit less uh, than the next one. We might get a bit less from noise. Uh, the next one here, let's say, for example, this one here uh, comes in error. So let's say instead of getting a one, we've got noise causes us to have a zero. So what would that be? Well, we would be sending the one, we'd be sending a negative A for the third bit, but the noise might cause us to land on the wrong side of the divide. So that when we do the detection, we are going to think that it is a plus A, and we're gonna think that a plus A was sent, we're gonna think that there was a zero that was sent. So in this case, we would be receiving this data sequence here. We would be receiving a one because the first one was close to here, then a zero because this one was close to here, but then we would be receiving, instead of the one that was sent, if that's where it came because of noise, we would be decoding it into a zero. If we're doing the standard type of detection, and we call this hard detection, and that's gonna be the interesting thing when we start talking about soft detection. So let's say we did this hard detection, we decided that this one in here in the detector, we decide that it's a plus A, so it maps to a zero. And then let's say all of the rest of them come through on the correct side, so the noise doesn't affect them too much. So this is the sequence that we would be getting here. And then when we would decode it, we would look at that sequence, and if it's parity check, we would notice that it doesn't have even parity. So our decoder would know that it would have to correct one of these bits. It doesn't know which one that it needs to correct though. And that's a challenge, especially in this single parity, it has no idea of knowing which one to change. So when it does the decoding, it wouldn't be able to get the right decoding with certainty. And this is where soft output decoding comes in. So this is this box that I've left empty here. Let me call this now soft output calculation. So soft output calculation happens in here. Instead of hard making a hard decision of choosing this to be plus A, let's think about what sort of soft decisions we could make. Well, something we could do in here is a maximum a posteriori calculation. And for details on that, look in the description below, you'll find a video on that. I'm gonna just write MAP here, maximum a posteriori probability, that A1 was sent. And that's what we're then gonna use in our decoder. So for example, let's say the probability uh, calculated, it was fairly confident here, it measured this, it was close to the uh, minus A, so it's pretty confident that it was a plus one that was sent. It's got a 0.98 probability. 
The next one was received close to this one here. So it's pretty confident that it was not a one. So it's a 0.02 probability of being a one. And then the third one is the one where we've said noise caused an error. Well, in here now we can see it's only just over this side of the decision. So there's actually a 0.51 probability that it's a zero and a 0.49 probability that it's a one. So here we've got a 0.49 probability. So the hard decision mapped it to a zero, but when we're working out these MAP, we're seeing that the probability is 0.49. And this is the important information that the decoder can then use, the soft information. The rest of them are fairly confident that it's a one and a zero and a one. And so I think you can see now that if the decoder was given this sequence of numbers, of probabilities, instead of hard decisions, it would be able to, again, recognize that some parity correction needs to happen because it could look at the hard decisions. It would always be able to generate this from this by doing the hard decisions, and it would realize that it doesn't have an even number of parity. Then it could look in here and see, well, which one was the most likely one where the error happened? And it would easily be able to see here that the third bit was the one that was most likely to have been in error because it's only 0.49 uh, certain that, well, it's only 0.51 confident that it's a zero. It thinks 0.49 that it could be a one. So the decoder would make the most sensible choice then would be to flip the third bit. And then in this case, it would get the correct sequence coming out. So this is soft output decoding. These are the outputs. They're not hard decisions. They are called soft decisions. This is one example. Um, of course, the decoder, we point out here that the decoder doesn't necessarily even need to make hard decisions itself. So this decoder could put out the, in the flipped version of this, where it's flipped this to 0.51, it could put those as an output as soft outputs. So it's taking soft inputs. We've got soft outputs from the detector, and then they're going into the decoder. The decoder could also put soft outputs, which would be 0 0.98, 0 0.02, 0 0.51, because it would have flipped that one to 0 0.51, then 0 0.94, 0 0.01, 0 0.96. It could put those as soft outputs into potentially the next stage of decoding. You could have, uh, uh, for example, this might be source decoding. So I'm going to call this decode two here, because in some systems, if you had source coding, I'll just put an SC here. So source coding, uh, which is compression or something, maybe, for example, mapping uh, English words, for example, into ones and zeros, compressing them uh, through this process here. Then you've got to do the decoding here. And this decoder here for source coding would, would benefit from knowing the soft information. Um, because then if the word at the output of this, the English word doesn't actually match up with an English word, then it knows that there's still an error. It could look back and find out which one that it thinks should be flipped. Not just in source coding, of course, this is also the case in turbo coding. So turbo coding uses two stages of channel coding. So this would also be a channel coder here. It puts an interleaver in between, but that's some details. But you have two layers of channel coding and then iterating around. The, this decoder feeds into this and then it feeds back into this and it keeps iterating around using the soft information. And this is, again, the soft output decoding another example with turbo decoding. So let's also uh, think just finally about a more complicated version than BPSK, where we don't just simply have the map estimate probabilities for the probability of one. So let's look at, for example, QPSK. So in this case, we've got four constellation points. And our sequence here is now going to be every two bits grouped together and modulated. So the first two bits are a one zero. So this would be this one would be sent, this symbol with this phase. Then a one one would be sent and then a zero one would be sent. So in this example here, you'd be sending that symbol, that symbol and that symbol. And let's say, for example, the first measurement uh, came out uh, over here because, of course, there's noise. So it doesn't exactly come out this way from the channel. So let's say the first one came out from here. Uh, and let's say the second one, because instead of a one one, Let's say this not one happened, there's, there would be the hard detection. So instead of this coming out, let's say that comes out. That might be the measurement, the measured amplitude and phase at, that comes out of the demodulator. And then the third one is a zero one. Perhaps this 
measurement here maps to the 0, 1. In this case here, it's just a generalization of the BPSK, and, but now we've got pairs of bits. So instead of just having a single number, which is the probability of a 1, we've now got to have a vector of the pairs of the bits. So for example, the first pair, which was sent as a 1, 0, uh, and if it came out in here, well, it might be that at the output of our soft output calculation, we're now working out the probability, given that that was received, what's the probability that the 0, 0 was sent? the probability that the 0, 1 was sent, the probability that the 1, 0 was sent, and the probability that the 1, 1 was sent. These are these four numbers. And so if that was measured, it could be that that calculates to a probability that this was sent because it's on the other side of the boundary. That's a low probability. It can work out it's 0 0.01. It would probably say, it could be that it's, let's say that it's 0 0.01, that this one had been sent, and given this received value here, the probability that a 1, 0 was sent is pretty high, that's 0.97, and the probability that a, point, uh, that a 1, 1 had been sent is pretty low, 0 0.01. So now we've got a vector of the probabilities of each of the possible transmitted symbols, and those probabilities after taking the measurement. So the second measurement was here, it's just on this side, so it's going to have a highest probability for the 0, 1, and then the next highest probability will be for the 1, 1. And we can see over here, uh, the highest probability is for 0, 1, the next highest for 1, 1, and the other two are low probabilities. And then for the third symbol, that, the third received uh, demodulated symbol coming in here, again, it's closest to this one here, so a high probability of a 0, 1. So again, you could do hard decoding, where you exactly map this back to there, and simply say that it's uh, definitely a 1, 0, this is, you would do hard decoding to say that this was a 0, 1, and you do hard decoding another 0, 1, but then you'd have this data sequence here, and again, you'd have all those problems with the decoder not knowing which ones to flip. But here, if you calculate these, again, they are maximum a posterior probabilities, but they're probabilities for each of the possible input symbols, then you can store that vector, and you can pass this vector into, or these sequence of vectors, into the decoder and it will then have all of this information. So not only will it know uh, that an error has probably happened here in the second, or could have potentially happened here, if, it, if it, the parity doesn't match, it will know an error happened, but it will now be able to tell you not just that one happened and you flip a zero back to a one, but it will be able to tell you what's the most likely other symbol from this constellation. Okay, and that's gonna be very beneficial in the decoding. Of course, this generalizes to much higher constellation orders, uh, QAM with very high constellation orders, you just need a long vector where you're saving all of this soft information and passing the soft information through. Um, just one other final point is it doesn't have to be maxima a posteriori probabilities. You could also have likelihood functions or log likelihood functions. And it doesn't have to be just on symbol by symbol detection like I've talked about here, but it could be sequence detection. So you have, for example, what's called the BCJR algorithm, or the soft output Viterbi algorithm. And so they are all doing versions of this where they are giving you numbers which indicate the probabilities or the likelihoods in each case of the different symbols given the measured value instead of making hard decisions to ones and zeros. Every time you make a quantization, you're throwing away information. So this is a way of keeping all that information for as long as possible through the decoding chain before finally, eventually, at the final point where you're getting the exact source data back, you will have to, of course, make hard decisions. So if this video has helped you understand soft output decoding, I give it a thumbs up, helps others to find the video. Don't forget to check out the description below where you'll find a web page with a full categorized listing of all the videos on the channel. And subscribe to the channel for more videos.